going through the first movie as a producer, I learned an awful lot, and especially an awful lot in that it was financed by United Artists, The Young Doctors, uh, 1959. It's Lou Ladmer's gulp, sob, choke, I'm still here, 1959. Uh, United Artists did not have a studio, they put up money and left the filmmakers alone so that I signed every check on that movie in a way I didn't in too many subsequent movies because they were all uh, financed by major studios. So it was a steep learning curve, uh, more than a steep learning curve, a very immersive learning curve. I believe it was um, Arthur Krim. Was he running United Artists? Arthur Krim was the head of it, and his co-partner was Bob Robert Benjamin. And uh, our immediate exec was David Picker, who later became head of production of United Artists, and also Paramount Columbia. It was his first picture as an exec, our first picture as uh, producers. And uh, since United Artists gave so much freedom to the, uh, the productions freedom. that they approved, um, so you were doing everything in there from, from writing checks for the crew to organizing, um, so you were really you always, immersive. You always do yeah. crew as a producer, even a major studio. A, a real producer is the person who starts the project and begins to hire all the people at a certain point, obviously, in consultation with the director. You don't tell the director what cameraman he's going to use, but you weigh in, you have uh, influence upon it, as I did uh, in several films. When I did The Great White Hope, directed by Marty Ritt, James Earl Jones, one of his very first films. He got an Academy Award nomination. Pulitzer Prize winning play. Yeah. Uh, Alexander is co-star. But the point I'm telling the story is, uh, Marty Ritt wanted James Wong Howe, who he'd worked with before. Great cameraman, really, really fabulous. But I was concerned he would be slow and push the budget beyond that which seemed appropriate. So I convinced the director, Marty Ritt, to use uh, a <laughs> senior moment, just suddenly blocked his name. I think Bernard Guffey, who uh, had uh, shot Bonnie and Clyde, good credentials, and he was known to be fast. I could go on singing with Judy Garland. Oh, yes, that started She's all my uh, gray hair. Judy Garland, <laughs> a gray hair giver. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting about that film is that it sort of paralleled her own life at the time in terms of well, her domestic problems. It's a, that were... uh, it's a wise observation you're making in terms of your question. Our goal was to parallel her life uh, even more closely, but she... Uh, powerfully resisted certain parts of that and threw her weight around and drove us crazy in all kinds of ways despite her wonderful talent so that it became uh, your observations correct intended to be about her life but it moved a, a, away from that a little more than we had wanted she was you know brilliantly talented I Always got goose flesh whenever she sang. But as I say, the gray hair in my head began with Judy Garland. She had her demons. I mean, it's pretty well documented. She was uh, up and down in weight with the aid of pills and medicine. She was maltreated by her home studio, MGM. Uh, so she, she had, unfortunately, severe psychological problems. I mean, charming, smart, funny, but she had her unstable moments. Yeah, and uh, was Ronald Neem a great director to work with? I mean, he went on to do The Prime of Miss Jean Brody and uh, well, uh, a lot of other yeah, he's a love films. First of all, he's a lovely man. Second of all, widely experienced. I think he began as a cameraman. He had worked with David Lean, lots of people, made lots of movies. So he was very assured and very good. But I think uh, this is not disparaging. 
but I don't think he had quite the uh, inner steel of his character to deal with Judy. Although in fairness, maybe no one did. But uh, so as a producer, uh, my, my then partner Stuart Millar and myself as producers, we had to work inordinately hard to the point where we would get up early in the morning and pick up Judy in our car to make sure she actually showed up to work. A film that I like quite a bit also, The Stage Play uh, by Gore Vidal, The Best Man, which yeah. I believe Franklin uh, J. Schaffner uh, had directed. Um, how did you come about finding the material? Have you seen the stage play being we, performed? We didn't or? find the material at all. <clears throat> United Artists, which had been our home company, uh, beginning with The Young Doctors and through the Judy Garland uh, film, uh, United Artists bought the stage rights that wrong, but the movie rights in the stage play uh, Best Man Gore Vidal for Frank Capra, four-time Academy Award winning director, fantastic. But then they got cold feet, meaning, uh-oh, was Frank Capra past it? Is he too old? Would he make too expensive of a, a movie? Political subjects never seem to do well financially. So they, however they did it, they took it away from Frank Capra, gave it to me and my partner because we seemingly, and in reality, represented uh, young, vigorous energy uh, today and tomorrow, whereas Capra was uh, perceived at that point uh, yeah. as yesterday. And we also, we made a, they, I think, uh, I think my memory's correct on this. They paid like $400,000 for the stage play, enormous sum in those days, and then we made the whole movie for uh, uh, $1 million. Wow. By the way, <clears throat> it was the first uh, movie, official uh, movie, that the cameraman Haskell Wexler shot. It got him in the union. He was... Uh, you know, he was shooting around, but uh, uh, we got him in the union of the best man. You had found this book, the, the novel, The Graduate, and you had optioned it for, I believe, $1,000. Yep. And after you had optioned that book, um, you had found Mike Nichols to possibly direct. Yes. However, at the time, Mike Nichols, I believe, was more known as a stage performer with Elaine May. He had maybe directed one he was a Broadway he play. Was, he was basically a performer, yes. He had done one play on Broadway. So what inspired you to go after Mike Nichols and believe in him that he could execute a film? I always loved Mike Nichols and Elaine May's humor on stage. <clears throat> it was mordant. It was very funny, but had a real sharp edge to it. The Graduate, I thought, was very funny, but the book, but nervous-making. Indeed, the movie he has some of that, too. He did one play on Broadway, Barefoot in the Park, starring Bob Redford, a Neil Simon comedy. And I saw the play, and it was just oozing smart direction, smart detail, good with the characters, everything. So on my blink hunch, yeah. I sent him the book. I didn't know him. I, I sent it to his agent. I picked up who's his agent here. Please give this to Mike Nichols. Uh, he did. And then I was in New York and I returned to my hotel one night and the front desk gave me a message. said, you got a telephone call from a Mr. Nichols. He said he likes the book. So I called him. We met the next day and I said, I told him the truth. I said, uh, I'm thrilled you like this. I think you're perfect for it. I have no deal, no anything. I, ha I have this book under option, and now I have you. So I propose that I try and get it set up as a movie, and that you and I be partners. We split everything down the middle. Whatever money comes in for the two of us, we split down the middle, and we share creative control. Yeah. The rest, as they say, is movie history. 
And then uh, I believe Calder Willingham was the first screenwriter on the project. Yeah, that project. was my brilliant idea. Uh, Mike Nichols was in New York, lived in New York, worked in New York. The financier, Joseph E. Levine, lived in New York. Schlockmeister of the world, but he was my Schlockmeister. So. Yeah, the graduate, I guess, was a bit of a change of pace for uh, Joe Levine. Like, he had really done a lot of, like, you know, Hercules and genre. Well, he did. He was and, a distributor. Yeah. He would go to Italy, buy Hercules Unchained, plaster his name over it, and sell it. I mean, or even he, dubbed it with American actors. He, he was, he was yeah. last stop in the line. Every studio turned me down. Not once, but twice. No one thought it was funny. No one thought it was good. You, I wrote that in my book, which you've evidently read. Uh, so it was Joe Levine or nothing. Yeah. And uh, he was much better than nothing. He put us the money and the deal I negotiated. He gave Mike and myself total or, uh, creative control, which is nice to have. So I know that um, Calder Willingham had written... Oh, Calder uh, Willingham. Um, so uh, I knew his work yeah. uh, as a novelist and uh, as a playwright. He did End as a Man or did the screenplay of it. Uh, I think Sam Spiegel produced it, The Redoubtable. At any rate, uh, Calder Willingham, his... Uh, his novels seemed to me that he'd be good casting for The Graduate. More importantly, he was in New York, and I thought he and Mike could work together. The financier was there. I lived in yeah. Los Angeles, worked in Los Angeles, so I chose him for that reason. Except Mike Nichols never even met him. When uh, Robbie Burns, the best laid plans of mice and men off Gang of Leg, don't work out. Yeah. Uh, so I did all the work with Willingham, and he delivered a script that was vulgar, it's surprising me, in that The Graduate, for its time, early 1960s, mid-1960s, uh, was provocative sexually. Calder Willingham added to it and made it vulgar. So I didn't even show it to Mike. I said, Mike, oh, no, I did wrong, 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 memory. Uh, I gave the script to Mike and said, I don't like it. I don't think you will either. Yeah. And he agreed. He said, no, he didn't like it. And then he recommended Buck Henry. And uh, Buck Henry wrote the script without ever seeing uh, the Willingham script. Mike did most of the work with Calder, although Mike got so busy directing one Broadway show after another that I also worked with Buck. And uh, when it finally came down to the credits, I said only Buck should have the credit. Uh, and I, as professional courtesy, I picked up the fellow telephone, spoke to a caller and said, Calder, I want to give you the courtesy of letting you know you're not getting any credit on this. It's all Buck's script. Yeah. And Calder Willingham said, this any writer probably would, I was naive, said, I'm going to protest it with the Writers Guild. I said, but Buck never even saw your script. He said, I'm still going to protest it. Well, he protested it successfully. He, uh, he, he, he gets not only credit, he gets in the first position ahead of Buck. And in showbiz, uh, the position is very important. Yeah. Uh, who goes first? In fact, when I was an Asian, someone taught me the following to say, uh, what is uh, position important? Have you ever heard of Barnum and Bailey, which in those days the big circus names? And he says, Barnum and Bailey, sure. And you say, well, what do you know about Bailey? Meaning his name went second, you do nothing about him, because P.T. Barnum was the famous uh, public face and name of that team. <laughs> Sorry, it took all the time to tell that story, but it was sort of charming uh, at the time. Now it's so really uh, none of Calder Willingham's material that he wrote was ever in The Graduate. It was all nothing, Buck Henry's script. Except the reason that occurred is, as producer, I imposed on Willingham the structure of the book and say this scene from the book, this scene from the book, this scene from the book. When Mike Nichols worked with Buck Henry, 
he would say, this scene from the book, this scene from the book, this scene from the book. And or Buck Henry in his own wisdom said, I'll use this, this, this. Yeah. So the structure I imposed on Willingham and that Mike imposed or Buck chose uh, for his version were so much the same, Willingham was there first and whoever gets there first gets the first credit. It's a coming of age story except that brilliant tag where their faces go dead on the bus means maybe he didn't yet come of age. Yeah. And I believe that was even an accident um, when it occurred. You thought what? Well, from what I read, that was an accident. Um, yeah. Yeah. That when it occurred, yeah. it was they, they didn't know what to do at that point, Dustin Hoffman and Catherine Ross. Yeah, they just that, sort of froze yeah. and yes, that, that's it became correct. a... You know, yeah. great moment, one but of the most a, memorable so, moments. So was an accident, yeah. but but it was a, a fortuitous accident that the director was smart enough to utilize and leave in, and as Elia Gazan, Gabs Gazan, said to me directly to my face, we were talking once. He said, "Any good actor." will know the character and the role better than me, because I'm the director. Yeah. And who knows what, uh, you might interview Dustin Hoffman, if you would agree, and say, ask him what went through his mind at that moment. Yeah. Oh, that was... Or, or wrong, forget at that moment, maybe in preparation for that scene. Yeah. Well, that's what was, uh, what is still great about Mike Nichols, is that he gives so much freedom to the actors, and not only freedom, but... Um, for what I understand, the, the graduate had this long rehearsal period, and so much was discovered in the rehearsal period that ended up going into the finished film. Uh, well, any good director knows how to extract the best from the actor to add to his own or her own directorial interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, he gives them freedom to discover. But uh, Mike is, is funny, he's, the one reason he's so talented and smart is he gives freedom, but within the constraints of what he wants to accomplish from a scene, from an actor, from the overall story. Yeah. Keeping everybody within the same well, movie, uh, uh, as opposed to letting them roam <laughs> off to... Uh, if you memory know. serves, 10 yeah. minutes ago I said he would quote random as the enemy. Yeah. Well, that applies to everything, how his point of view of a, of a scene. How would you define a, a producer, um, especially your type of producer who um, not only develops material, but um, is, understands the mechanics of how a production operates? How would you define your job if you were to kind of... Wrap it all up. I've never been asked that. In my book, which you've read, I quote a friend of mine who was a Broadway producer, and uh, his uh, little old world mother didn't know what a producer did, so he said, Ma, a producer is a person who knows a writer, meaning it all starts with right there. How would I define? Well, yeah, I, I do have a definition. I currently am a professor uh, at USC. I run, I'm the chair of the uh, Peter Stark producing program. And I define a producer as, quotes, a producer is the person who causes the film to be made. A good producer causes it to be made well. You ended up directing a couple of projects. Was your producing hat still on in the back of your head as you were directing? Or did you feel that you could focus entirely on, uh, on, on directing the film? I don't remember. Probably half and half. All I learned is I wasn't as good at directing as producing. Why I like the experience. Control. I mean, ugly word, but great to have. Why do you think um, you weren't as apt to be a director as you were to be a, a producer? Uh, number one, I'm a, a little too literal. Number two, I'm more word-oriented than visual-oriented. 
And number three, most important of all, most important of all, I didn't choose the right subjects. And number four, number four, where was I when I needed me? I needed a producer. Yeah. And so I used to sometimes say to Mike Nichols, I said, hey, Mike, even geniuses need someone to talk to. And when you're working with a director uh, yourself, um, do you usually let the director alone at a certain point and have them execute the project? Or do you like to sort of step in and give notes from time to time uh, well, that you think you can aid them in the process uh, during the course of production? Well, as from the moment I choose the director and we work together to get up to the first day of shooting, I'd like to give lots of input and be collaborative and be open to having my mind changed also. Once the film starts shooting, uh, I'm one that does, I'm a producer that does not like to be on the set, on the stage, or on the location. I am, because that's my job, but uh, I learned the hard way very early in my career that I can affect a director, if I start giving him many notes or what have you, I can improve, to my taste anyway, the director's work about a half of 1% at the cost of great divisiveness in the whole production. What I do talk is I, I watch dailies, the previous day's work with the director, and privately me to that director alone, give him or her my comments or my notes, if I have any, I don't have them all the time, but there's times I'll make a point about as a character moving in the right direction for our overall story or things like that. What do you think is the proudest moment of your career? Is there anything that stands out to you as, as something where, where you thought, you know, um, I've really made a, an accomplishment as a producer? Well, uh, have no awareness of an answer to your question at the time, and maybe it's raised while it's happening. But at this point in time, I think the proudest thing is I kept it going for 40 years and made 40 pictures and not totally, but for the great bulk of the time of the projects, as whoever wrote the song Sinatra sang, I did it my way. I could do projects that I cared about. I mean, indeed, I <laughs> was Benjamin Braddock. At the same time, I was Jack Johnson, the black heavyweight champion of the world. At the same time, I was the uh, Chicano gang member in a film, unsuccessful film I made, Walk Proud. So that I had personal identification quite often with the stories I chose. It's, it's as if the stories I chose to make in the film chose me.